And you believe there are people that don't love being in God's house? I just don't think they found the right house. Amen? Amen. If you don't love being in God's house, then maybe you shouldn't be here. Amen? Or maybe you should be here, but listen more. Listen to God's word. Uh, hear what God's word has to say for each one of us, because God only wants the best for you. Amen? Amen? A lot of our friends and family, they want what they want of us, but God wants what's best for you. Now, this chapter, this passage has been preached on by myself, by Charlie, and uh, according to my Bible and, and many others by uh, other, other ministers many, many times. We've heard this all growing up, but I want us to take this from a few years' perspective. Uh, how many of you uh, like taking tests in high school, uh, in school, college, whatever? You just love taking tests? All right. Well, I didn't. I had what they call test anxiety, and it's not because I got scared of the test, it's just I didn't want to be last. So I would uh, notice that somebody would get up and be done with their test already. I'd be like, get this. And I'd do the old abacadabra method, A, B, A, you know, like that, just to that, be done with it. I'd fail a lot of tests. i got to go ahead and tell you that, too. And that didn't really work out all right. But most of the tests had like A, B, C, and D. And some of them, of the meaner questions, had like A, B, C, D, and E. And I really hated that. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be easier if it was just like A and B? If you get a chance. And if you really want to throw something in A, B, and C, and C would be like all the above or something like that. That would be a lot easier. So I'm only going to give you A, B, and C tonight. Sound good? Oh, you got to remember it's A, B, and C. <laughs> all right. So let's go for it. Here's what happened. The Bible says in chapter 5 of John, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Can everybody say Bethesda? One more time. Some of you have a lisp. It's okay. Having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. In other words, people that could not move or could not see, could not hear. They were impotent. They were not potent in the fact that they had some of their faculties either missing or they were not working properly. Blind, halt, withered. Waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. In other words, what happened was, and John wasn't speaking like this was some kind of fairy tale. He was telling you, as a matter of fact, one time every year an angel would come down and touch the water. And then you would have all of these people laying on five of these porches, kind of like five wells around this pool. They would be racing each other to get the pool first. And whoever got the pool first, that person was healed. Now, what's interesting about this was that the angel didn't heal anybody. Amen? The water didn't heal anybody. Amen? What healed them was the faith in God. Faith is always answered. Faith is always answered by blessings. Faith is always answered by healing. Faith is always answered. And it wasn't the fact that the angel touched the water. That just made their faith grow even more. But their minds were set on whoever touched the water first. But I'm telling you, even the second person could have been healed if their faith had been great. Even the third person, the fifth person, the 85th person, every person on those porches could have been healed. Because when God does something, he says he's no respecter of persons. Amen? And what he does for one, he'll do for another. He's not going to say, listen, if you're fast enough and if you're strong enough to get in this pool first, you'll be the one healed. He said he wants to heal all that are lame. He said he's come to open blind eyes and to unstop deaf ears. That's what he said. Amen. Now, some of us are blind spiritually. Some of us may be deaf spiritually. Let me tell you something. The waters are troubled tonight and God wants to heal. And he's not just talking about the person next to you, before you or behind you. He's talking to each one of us. He's not willing that we be impotent. He's not willing that we be crippled spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially. He wants to heal and heal totally because that's what God does. Now, knowing this, here's what happened. A certain man was there. Verse number 5, which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. For 38 years, this guy had been sick, had been crippled. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, 
he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Do you hear the question? Or are you listening to the question? Jesus, the creator of everything, said, Do you want to be healed? That's all he asked him. He didn't ask him how old he was. He didn't ask him what the problem was. He didn't ask him what the situation was. He already knew all that. Well, what he wanted to know was, are you willing to be made whole? You see, that's where we stand tonight. God knows our infirmity. He knows our situation. But he's here tonight asking you, do you want to be made whole? Now, here's what happens to a lot of us. The same thing that this man did, he started out with an excuse. Not yes. Not that's all I want. He started out with an excuse. <laughs> the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. I got no one to carry me down there. I can't get in the water. Doesn't matter if the angel came down in the next hour. I got no one to get me down here. So I've been here for 38 years. But while I'm coming, Another steps down before me. In other words, even under my own strength, while I'm pulling myself through the pool, somebody gets down there before I do. Oh, now it's somebody else's fault. First he was a victim, now he's somebody else's fault. Jesus said unto him, notice Jesus didn't say, well now, are you sure? Is that really the situation? Jesus just looked at him and he ministered straight to his need. He said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the Bible says in verse number 9, And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, A, accept responsibility for your life. It's pretty good, isn't it? In this new year, maybe you didn't do it last year, but in this new year, accept responsibility for yourself. This is something that many people hate to do, especially if they're in a bad shape because of their decisions. They would rather find somebody to accept responsibility for their actions. Now, watch this. I've had people promise me that they were going to do this or that or the other, whether around church, outside of church, at work, wherever. I will do this, and then they don't do it for whatever reason. Immediately, they start blaming somebody else. Has anybody ever done that? I've done that over before too. I said I was going to do something, and guess what? Oh, I couldn't because of this. I didn't because of that. And it was an excuse. How many here like to make excuses? It gets us out of it, doesn't it? That's why we make excuses. It's not that we didn't have good intentions when we started. We wanted to. We were going to. We had every intention of doing it. But when it came down to it, it was a little too much hassle. It took effort. And so we made an excuse. And because we made an excuse, well, at least I'm out of it now. Watch this. This is a popular concept in our society. So they came up with a term for it. It's called being politically correct. Anybody ever heard that term? There are things you can't talk about. There are things you can't talk about. Now listen to this. Everything bad in your life, because we are being politically correct, everything bad in your life is not your fault, but it is somebody else's fault, or you can blame the environment. Hmm? You can blame the educator who did not teach you well enough. You can blame your parents, because they raised you wrong. You can blame your genetic well, I'm like I am because my daddy was this way and my grandfather was this way and that's just how I am. We can blame, 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 but let me tell you something. When you stand before an almighty God, he's not going to say, well, wait a minute, what's in your genetic code? He's not going to look at you and say, well, how did your daddy act? Well, He's not even going to look at you and say, well, oh, wait a minute, was your teacher nice to you? Did your teacher give you a break? Did they give you an extra 10 minutes on that test because they proved that test anxiety? When you stand before Almighty God, you are responsible for your actions. And I am responsible for mine. I am not responsible for your actions. Now understand this. A lot of people will take that and say, hey, what I do is my business. It's none of your business. Untrue. In the family of God, you are my business and I am your business. 
The Bible says if we see each other overtaken in a fall, that we should go to one another. Why? Because we don't want bad things to happen. Right? Now, accept responsibility for your life. Galatians 6, 4 and 5 says this, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Every person sitting here tonight faces two kinds of circumstances. Circumstances you cannot control and circumstances you can control. Will you agree with me? Just give me a north and south if you agree. You don't want to say amen, that's fine. But those are the two types of circumstances. And you're going to face those circumstances. The ones you cannot control, you can plan for them. You may not be able to control but you can plan for them. And the ones you can't control, you need God's help to control. But unfortunately, there are three types of people. And you can check mark in your mind which type you are. Accusers, excusers, or choosers. Accusers, excusers, or choosers. Accusers blame everyone else. I have been an accuser. How about you? Blame somebody for my problems. Blame somebody else for my stupid decisions. As a matter of fact, I blamed my brother one time. For my decision, because he didn't help me. For my decision to bang myself in the head with a wrench. He could have offered some kind of help, but instead all he offered was laughter with people. That's that guy right there. That's all he offered. He needs prayer. I was working on my Jeep out in the middle of a parking lot and I had a wrench and instead of saying, brother, because I love you, because our mama and daddy bore us both, because I want to help you, let me give you a hand with that to break that bolt loose. But instead he just sat back and looked at me with his red hair. I don't understand that. And I grabbed that wrench and it slipped off there and went, bang, my head. Immediately I called on the Lord. Jesus! <laughs> Thinking my brother would be right there for me. He was rolling around the parking lot holding his stomach and laughing at me at my peril. It was his fault. It was his fault. Or it could have been my fault. We'll let the Lord decide. <laughs> I was an accuser. Now, so I don't feel alone and I don't go to bed and cry my big pillow to sleep tonight. Uh, how many here have been accusers also? You blame somebody else for your stupid actions, your stupid decisions? Hey man, all right. Okay, good. I'm not alone. Listen, in this new year, be grown up about it. Take the blame for your own actions. How about that? I promise you, I promise you, you have a better year than the last. Because when you accept responsibility for your own actions, here's what happens. First off, most of the time you're going to do something about it. I never sat this close pulling on a wrench before, uh, after that. Never ever again. Learned my lesson. Number two, there are excusers. They have an excuse for every decision. How many have done that? Got an excuse. Got an excuse. I have an excuse for everything in the flesh. You have an excuse for everything in the flesh. We could go out here right now if we wanted to. Everybody could leave the church and, 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 and nobody ever come back. And we'd have an excuse. We'd have a reason. Anybody that's not here tonight, I can guarantee you they have an excuse for why they are not here. Let me tell you something. In this past year, you may have been one of the ones to make an excuse of not being in church or not living like God would have you live or making bad decisions. Let me tell you something. You're in God's house now. You've made a good decision. Don't follow up with a bad decision. Sound good? Choose not to make excuses for bad actions. Own it. And then there are choosers. Choosers choose to accept responsibilities for themselves. Now, what does that have to do with the story we read? Well, this man, instead of accepting the responsibility of having his faith Rather than in the pool, in the God that made the pool. Having the faith to, to get in the pool. 
who are not even comfortable with the God that would give him the healing already, chose to blame it on somebody else. Chose to, to make an excuse of why he couldn't get into the pool. Even when the master of the pool and the angel and the creator, he himself, was standing before him, offering him a new life and a new existence. He chose rather, he chose rather to make an excuse. I tell you tonight that God stands in our midst and he wants to give each one of us new life. Maybe we've been crippled in our finances this last year. Maybe we've been crippled spiritually in this last year. Maybe we've been crippled emotionally this last year. It's been an emotional toll on ourselves this last year. Hey, let me tell you something. The healer stands before us and he's asking you, will you be made whole? Don't make excuses. Either you will or you won't. Because if you will, the master is here. If you are healed here, he says he wants you to rise up and go forward. Rise up and do something. And do like this man did. Immediately, he cried. Don't waste time. Don't make excuses. Or, you can look at God. And by not making that choice, you're making a choice already. You're saying, I'm just going to refuse it. Now, number or uh, letter B. Believe you can change. Satan, as we found out this morning, will tell us that we cannot change. That there is nothing that we can do. But the Bible says all things are possible to them that believe. And if you don't remember any other verse in this new year, remember this one. It's Junior's favorite verse. Philippians 4 and 13. And it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. For, I think it was like, I think it's been like 40 something years. Jimmy Cook has had an addiction. For 40 something years, God has been working on Jimmy Cook. And last Sunday night, Jimmy Cook went out to the car and he quoted a verse that I quoted during preaching and he said, God, he said, I can't go to you. He said, but you can come to me and I ask you to take this addiction away. God never gave up on him. God never gave up on him. The church didn't shun him, but we prayed for him. The church didn't look down upon him, but we loved him, which is what the church should do. We supported him. And we tried to help him all that we could. We prayed for him. And last Sunday night, sitting in that parking lot right there, Jimmy Cook was delivered from his addiction. Isn't God awesome? <laughs> Satan told him for 40 years, there's no way you can give him up. Satan told him for 40 years, there's no way you can give him up. Satan is telling you right now, there's no way you can quit this. There's no way you can. Listen, some of our worst addictions are our attitudes. Talk to me now. Our bad attitudes, our attitudes of aggravating others, of griping about things, of moaning about things that aren't even our business to moan about or gripe about. Our attitudes of when things don't go the way we should, we let everybody know with anger. Hey, let me tell you something. That's an addiction that you don't feel like you can break, but let me tell you something. God says you have power over that thing. There is no pill, there is no drug, there is no drink, there is no attitude. There is no person, there is no place, nor thing that God's word does not give us power over. Amen, church. Because my Bible says, your Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. God has power. God has put people and programs in place. Because some people, some people need more help than others. I did. But God delivered let me tell you something. The church, God, has always been here for me. And he's always told me you can. When the world and everybody else, friends and family alike, even myself, said I couldn't, God said I could. And God delivers. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. For the next 365 days, I want you to believe that verse. I can do all things through Christ. I can. See, and finally, see. Clarify what I really want. 
make a list and decide what's really important in your life. Studies have shown time and time again that when you make a list, it kind of clarifies things for you. Some years ago, about 14, 13 years ago, I sat down. Selena and I have been married a few years. Uh, she was she she'd be home for a few hours. And I remember sitting down and I remember taking a piece of paper out about this big and just making a little list of the things that I wanted to accomplish. And when I got done making the list and I did it in pencil, thank God. When I got done listen, looking at the list, I was like, that doesn't even make sense. Why would I want to do that? That's not even important. Crossed a few things off, and then I put some things on there that I really wanted. <laughs> And I'm talking about schools that I wanted to go to, uh, the education I wanted to have, this, that, the other. And all but one of those, God has allowed me to do. And the one of those things that God didn't allow me to do, there was a purpose for that. And he showed me the purpose for it. You know what I'm saying? It set a goal <laughs> and it clarified my vision of things. Now, where do you want to be spiritually? Do you want to be, a lot of people, I hear this, I hear this, this junk, this saying, I just want to be back where I was with God. That's a bunch of junk. If you want to be back where you were with God, and that place allows you to slip away, then you want to be better than what you were, right? That's where I want to be. I want to be better than I was with God. I want to be better every day than I was the day before. And I want the same thing for God's people. God has a vision for you and I. He clarified his purpose when he looked at that lame man. He said, wilt thou be made whole? God has a vision for each one of us. And when the, when the words of this book were penned, every single word was his vision of life and peace and happiness and hope for every one of us. Isn't that awesome? That he took the time <laughs> over the years to inspire men and women to, to minister through, to us through this book. So that we could learn how to live. If God cares that much. And then sent his son to die for us. He's got a lot invested in our life. Your values will determine your vision. And your desire determines your direction. Now, what do you desire in life? What do you want? First Sunday of the new year. It's time to make the important things the important things. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult. But let me tell you something. I can do all things through Christ. There's going to be a lot of pain along the way. I can do all things through Christ. Because the joy will far outweigh the pain when that trumpet sounds. And I'm not here, but I'm gone. Amen. And the Bible tells me that that can happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Faster than you can blink. God will come and he'll call his own. I want to be one of those. <laughs> really simple to do too. Starts out by saying, God, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of those sins. I accept you into my heart and into my life. And then every day, live by his word. That's simple. That's simple. There are difficult decisions to make. God will help you. I can do all things through Christ. There are people that you won't be able to have in your life. That's fine. I can do all things through Christ. There are places you may not be able to go. That's fine. I can do all things through Christ. There are times that the power of the bed will absolutely take hold on you on Sunday mornings. I can do all things through Christ. There are times... Or you may have to push away a plate of food because you want to get serious down to business with God. That's a hard one for me, but let me tell you something. I can do all things through Christ. It's strengthening me. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? <laughs>